We've been talking about 1 Peter. We're going to skip ahead a little bit today. We'll explain that. If I had a title of this, I'd say, Don't Let Fear Stand in Your Way. Be ready. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. First, let me tell you, tell you a story. You know, after I became a follower of Jesus, I went to um, Southern Illinois University to study pre-med. And I met a girl at college who became a friend. Uh, she was raised in the church. And, but you could sense something was not right. Of course, I care about people, but I care about myself and how I look before people. So it took me a while to um, get the courage to ask the questions. God gave me strength and uh, some insight to ask the right questions. She was bitter and angry about her past. She had been abused by someone very close to her. And it was big in her thinking. It was eating her up. At the time, I didn't have any formal training in biblical counseling. But I did have the Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us and helps us. And he did in this difficult situation. She hated this person and she could not bring herself to let go of that hatred. She said she was a believer, and so I challenged her. I said, you know, if you're a believer in Jesus, you have to practice forgiveness. It's what the Bible says you must do. Now, this was a naive college student saying this, and if I said it today, I think I would be able to offer some other things to help this situation. But God blesses his spiritual children even when they're naive. Thank God. She became really convicted by that thought of her unforgiveness, and I had the opportunity to share some scripture with her. I told her about my past and that if God was able to forgive me, you know, certainly um, he can forgive others and he can teach you to forgive, give you the love that it takes to forgive. It wasn't my persuasive power or word choice. She became involved in a church that taught the Bible as well. And over a few months, she became radically changed. She was able to forgive that person. And she was able to um, um, become, she was a joyful person. It was amazing to see God work in her life, to change her. I'd only been changed myself maybe a year before that. It was, it was so cool to watch God's work in a human heart to, to radically make a difference. And that's one of the primary reasons we're here, right? God is a God of rescue. And we're here to go to other people around us to be about the rescue of lost sinners. He graciously allows us to participate in that. And we don't save anyone. He saves, but we get to watch and we get to help. So, are you ready? Boy, uh, that was a rousing answer. Let's try that again. Are you ready? Thank you. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. Um, we got up to verse 8 last time, and so I believe Pastor's going to resume next time and go through verses 12 through, um, or wait, 8 through 12. Is that right? So I just want to use 12 as a connecting verse to, to get a thought. So let's read this together. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. Now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, 
God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. Verse 12 here encourages us in that God listens to our prayers. He watches over us. Incredibly encouraging thought. He protects us. But notice the last half of the verse. It says, but the Lord turns his face against those who who do evil. What does that mean? God turning his face against those who do evil. What is that? Okay. And, and an opposition in, in people who are, are not his children, right? So, so we see a move here from the opposition of God towards others to the opposition of people with us. Verse 13. Verse 13, now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? First of those people, I'm sorry, in most cases, if you do good, even people around you who are, don't appreciate your faith, um, they're usually going to respond pretty well, aren't they? A lot of people are there. They want to see good done in the world. They're not going to get mad or lash out at you most of the time. Even if you're a sold out, really enthusiastic person, what they used to call a Jesus freak. Maybe you're you're just totally into this. Some people find that annoying. If you love God and turn turn the love of others, it will usually not uh, generate conflict, but there are exceptions. Let me tell you about a conference we went to. Doug and Tom and I were at this conference last year, the ACBC conference, and last year it was on transgender and homosexuality. And we uh, we were picketed by a small group from the LGBT community in Louisville, Kentucky, who uh, who felt our biblical approach would cause harm. They were mad. The conference actually taught us to be, I think, uh, gave me a new perspective of loving and accepting, not accepting the lifestyle and condoning it, but loving the people in the movement and not looking down on them anyway or distancing myself from them or, or, or any of us but engaging them, get, getting a place to engage them. You know, there's no other way biblically to share the gospel unless you are connected to another person, unless you can talk to them respectfully and be with them. And I understood that opposition this year, or last year when we went, but but this year it was different. And there was another group there that picketed us this year. But this wasn't the LGBT community. The conference wasn't on that. But it it was a church that picketed us this time. And the church picketed us because we would come out and say, you should lovingly engage homosexuals. They did not want to see that. They felt you should have a strong stand for God. You had to stand against evil. You must confront them, shout, get mad. Let them know that they're sinful. They need to repent. I mean, let me tell you this, this story that came out at the conference. This, was, this really touched my soul. I hope it does yours. 
There was a pastor at our conference, and he shared this story about there was a gay rights protest in Ottawa, Canada. And he was there. One of his friends, who was a pastor, asked him, he said, um, you know, you normally would have been there up front with us at this protest, and I didn't see you there. Where were you? The pastor said, uh, well, I was there. Well, he said, uh, I didn't see you. Where were you at? He said, I was on the LGBT side. I was talking to some guys over there, and uh, I was asking them some questions, asking them about their story, about what made them uh, who they are. And he said, oh, I don't, don't be worried. You know, I didn't change my views, and I'm not becoming a bibl- unbiblical heathen here and joining the other side. I'm not saying that. But he wanted a chance to talk, to listen, to ask questions, to understand better what makes them tick. And he said, I I could say that day that I made a couple of friends. They said that no no one had ever asked them questions like he had asked before. Isn't that sad? Just general questions about their life. And it made me think he, he loved them. And if Jesus were here, where would he be? Which side? And where would we be? Which side? It's a question to ask yourself. You may suffer for your stand sometimes at the hands of unbelievers, sometimes at the hands of so-called believers, and sometimes at the hands of even believers. Suffering comes from many fronts. I can't tell you that any of these protests caused me to really suffer that much. I don't want to imply that. Verse 13. Now who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But if you suffer, remember this. First Peter is a book written to encourage those who suffered in the first century. And they were suffering at the hands of Rome under Nero. Intense torture and suffering in their day for their faith. The types of suffering we've seen in this book, it's about unjust suffering of many kinds, and we can relate in a number of ways in our lives, but we just don't get persecuted like that today. Now, it may be on the increase here. But this is what it's talking about. It's about talking about suffering persecution for our faith, faith. But I guess we need to have a full perspective of this. We tend to think, I tend to think a lot of times of dramatic examples about um, people who are beaten or who are martyred. But isn't persecution broader than that when people, your friends, stop hanging around with you? When the wives uh, or husbands of those who are in church, they you know, put in little snide remarks and make fun of their faith, or they just turn away and won't even listen when they talk about it. It may involve people at your work who think that this is kind of stupid, you know. They may mock it openly. They may just talk about it behind your back. It's persecution as well. It's not the same level This should be because we're believers, not because we treat people badly. I mean, when we're, we uh, become a jerk to other people, that's not good. When we're unkind or mean, then the suffering we would get, we deserve, right? And that's what it says in um, chapter 2, verse 20 in, in 1 Peter. So because we have people around us who oppose us in our faith, we shouldn't worry or be afraid of their threats. It's the fear of man, spoken of in Proverbs, and that's, it says it brings a snare. It keeps us 
from doing what we need to do. How do they make you afraid? They, they threaten. Sometimes they could be loud threats. It reminded me, uh, we were talking about Satan. And there's a particular animal that it says Satan is like. Do you remember what it is? He's a roaring lion. If you know anything about lions, I understand that lions will roar to intimidate their prey. And I think that's the same idea here that Satan and his people, both, they want to intimidate us, to to paralyze us, to make us inactive. He'd like to devour us. But he can for believers. Leaves people cowering and defenseless. Today we're here, you know, there, there's, um, became aware in Texas that there's this thing um, uh, where they were monitoring pastors in Texas about their sermons, and they were going to decide if there was hate speech in their sermons. And I suppose then if the government determined that you had hate speech, they might somehow audit your church or close down your church. I don't know what that meant. It actually didn't... Okay, okay. So it wasn't as bad as it, it could be, but yeah, yeah. So that didn't um, that didn't fly, but it's out there still. So we shouldn't be intimidated. We have to preach the whole counsel of God, right? That's what um, that's our job here. We can't be threatened by people or cower or or not do what we're supposed to do. Not be disabled by fear. We still have freedom, thank God, to preach the truth. Verse 15. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. That's what it says in the NLT. Now, it says something different in other versions. Give me another version there. Verse 15. Okay, in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord. That's the ESV. And what's, does anybody have a King James? What does it say? Okay, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. A little different perspective. Certainly all this means that God is to have first place. That if your heart is, has a throne, He's to be on that throne. There's to be nothing else there but Him. He's to have the preeminence, the supremacy in your life. Nothing before Him. No people before Him. Uh, these unbelievers that get in your face, but even more, your boss or your spouse sometimes or your kids, there's to be no people above Him. No philosophy, no psychology or idea system from whoever, Dr. Phil or even Fox News or NPR. There's systems that are there. You can't have your things come before Him, not your car, your house, or your money. Nothing before Him. And to put Him in His proper place, it's the fear, that's the fear of God. I trust Him completely. I will follow Him only. And if I learn about this God who is the supreme ruler of the universe, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and who will judge everyone, every one of us will stand before God. Believer or unbeliever, we will all stand before God. That's why Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10.28 when you fear God as you should, every other fear is put in its place. It takes a back seat. The divine fear is the antidote to all other fears that cause us to sin, including the fear of suffering, including the fear of man. 
Last part of verse 15. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. What does that have to do with the fear of man? When somebody, you get in that situation and you're needing to say something to someone, what happens to you? Do you worry? Do you sometimes don't say anything because you're afraid what you might say would not be the right thing? Is that true? It's sure true for me. We get scared. An opportunity to speak. What, what will that person think of me? Will they be offended? Will they walk off? Uh, I don't know the Bible well enough to give an answer. I may screw it up. What will I say? So is this, is this a suggestion that God gives here? Be ready to give an answer. It's actually a command, isn't it? The word apologia. Oh, apology. So, so now am I apologizing for God? You know, I have this kind of crazy faith and, you know, uh, God, he, you know, he kind of makes these 10 suggestions and we need to follow those. Uh, I don't think we're supposed to apologize for God. And that's not what the word means. It means to give a defense. You should be ready to tell people who might ask, what, uh, what do I tell them? What could we tell them? What is this answer that he wants us to give? What does it involve? The testimony. That's the first one I had. Yep, your testimony. Do you have it down where you could do it in three to five minutes? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully they're they they are a good friend and so and the rest of us I mean we should be ready hopefully in that opportunity to be able to share your story. Can you do that? If you can't do that, maybe you should write out your story. In fact, you should write out your story so you can share when you're asked. What what else could we say? Sometimes you don't get much of a chance, so sometimes it's just a few words. Maybe salt and light to um, try to plant a seed. But other times you get a bigger opportunity, more time, and this person's really open. What would you do with that? Any kind of a message you'd want to share? The Gospel. Thank you, Nick. We should be able to um, share the Gospel. So let me ask you this. What's the gospel? Okay. And that's that that's the solution. What's the problem? The problem is sin. And how many people are involved in this sin plague? Everybody, every person on earth, right? And because of sin, what does it do to our relationship with God. It separates us, uh, Isaiah 59, 2, from God. So there's, there's a gulf between us and God. Anything else? Ephesians 2, maybe? What does that say? We're dead in trespasses and sins. We're, we're dead and we're separated. That's not good. That's a problem. So, so, so what's the next step? It comes to Sandy. What was the answer? It's Christ. And how is Christ the answer? What, is, what does He do? Okay, and what did He do to do that? Okay, we repented of our sins. We come to Him. And what was it that He did? Substitutionary death, Substitutionary death on the cross. He died as a sacrifice for our sins. And through that, we get our, through His shed blood, we get our sins washed away and we get His perfect righteousness in our place. So, 
Now, before when we were separated from God, when we were dead in sins, he resurrects us, he brings us to life, and he brings us back home to God is what this passage says. Cool. And his resurrection is the seal of approval God put on this sacrifice. So by confessing our sins, by repenting, by believing in this sacrifice, we receive eternal life. That answer gives hope. As the song said, He is our hope in Christ. We've been rescued from sin and death and hell. And we want to see other people rescued, right? God is, He gives us those three parables and it talks about the lost sheep and the 99 go off and there's one little stupid sheep that's, you know, going to put everybody else in jeopardy and he's got to leave and go after that one. And he's going to do it, right? God goes for the one to rescue them. His heart is about rescue. He is the, the father in the prodigal son who son has said, I wish you were as good as dead. Give me the money. And he leaves and he wastes it on debauched living. And then when he's with the pigs, he comes to a realization it'd be better at home being a servant at my dad's house. So he goes on his way home and, and looking down the road is who? His father, he's watching for him to come home. How can he run out to meet him? He was watching. God cares about rescue. He is all over it. It is his heartbeat. We need to be about rescue. He's so invested that he made you every one of you who believe, an ambassador of his kingdom. He gave you this message. He wants you to share it with everyone who's willing, who asks. And he doesn't want you to force it on people. That's unproductive to stuff it down somebody else's throat. That doesn't work well. But, but there's an interest. There's the Holy Spirit that actually works in men and women's lives and there's an openness that we can see. He doesn't want you to be undercover, right? In the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the light that's under a bushel that's covered up. The light is covered up. He doesn't want that. He wants your light to shine, to shine out to this world, to people around you. So can you give an answer? Can you give an answer? If not, you need to write your testimony. You need to pray for wisdom in the situation. If it's only a few words you can share, ask for God's help. Think about that situation. It may come up again. Maybe God will um, give you words over time to say to you when it happens. And he wants you to know the gospel, be able to share it. If you don't know how to share the gospel, then there, there are little tracks that can help you to remember things. You can use those. You can like get help too, because there's like a ton of people around here who know how to share the gospel. Who, who can do it? Who can share the gospel with another person or has, has done that? So there's a lot of hands up. Come and talk to one of us. Come talk to Pastor. Come talk to me. Don't let the fear of man stop you, but we want to be a part of the rescue. There's an attitude that goes with this answer. Look at verse 16. What's the attitude we're supposed to have? Is it, you know, 
this person, he's just lost. I mean, he, he's doing stupid stuff. He's, yeah. Is that the attitude? No, it's like supposed to be gentle and respectful. It's not arrogant, not looking down on the other person. They're so stupid. Why did they do that? Did we ever do stupid things in our lives? Yeah, I've done some pretty stupid things in my life. We aren't over anyone. In 1 Corinthians, I believe it says, what do you have that you did not receive? And the answer, nothing. Nothing that I have that I didn't receive from God. Our attitude, like one beggar sharing with another beggar where we got the bread. Gentle. Not judgmental. Not arguing or striving, but respectful. Verse 16, having a good conscience, it says in the ESV. The NLT actually says a clear conscience, and I don't like that as well. I don't think it's just as simple as like clearing your conscience by confessing sin, but I think it has the idea more of having a healthy, well-functioning conscience. Some people, we're told in Scripture, have a weak conscience or a seared conscience. Many times that comes from repetitive sin or lack of biblical understanding and input. And we're told uh, in another place that there's such a thing as an evil conscience, a twisted, distorted conscience. Jesus speaks about that. He says this. He, was, uh, he said, respecting his disciples, that the time would come when whoever should kill them would think that they were doing God's service. In other words, they're going to kill their disciples and say, it's of God. Do we ever see that today? Wow, in this world today, ISIS beheads people for their religion. We've seen it in the past. Saw millions killed in the Inquisition in the name of religion. An evil conscience. Some of the worst crimes the world has known committed in the name of religion. Everyone has a conscience. The conscience functions like this. I guess some people think... Maybe it's like its own source of goodness or light. It's not that. It's more like in your house, a skylight, like you cut a hole in the roof and you put a window in so the light can come in. And a, um, a good conscience is like that. We don't have an inherent um, good in us, but we can have a situation where we uh, kind of display the light, the moral light that we're given. A good conscience is a product of a redeemed heart which has been trained by Scripture and prayer and uh, teaching. We need a good conscience. In this world, it's filled with people caught up in their sin. And what is the truth? Many people don't know what the truth is. And they oppose us. And notice this. It speaks here about it says here, when you are slandered. Do you see that? So, so does it mean that we might be slandered sometime? It might happen to us? No, it says when, doesn't it? Like, you're going to get slandered. If you live for Christ, there will be slander against you. Don't be surprised. That's going to happen. Now, it helps to have a life that's above reproach. Can you imagine in this election that we had, if Donald Trump were a man above reproach, would the election have been close? It wouldn't have been close. But it wasn't so, and he barely won. People often will not believe the slander, and the person who spreads that uh, will be ashamed if they see that you have a, a life that is... Um, that is good. You're living for God, doing it His way. And notice it's not, um, it's not what you said here that they notice, but it's your life. It's what you do. It's how you live. 
And we don't produce that. It, it comes from inside of us by the Holy Spirit. It's lived out. Because we belong to Christ. Look at verse 16. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants. This assumes that your suffering is a part of God's sovereign plan. Is that true? Is our suffering part of God's plan? We were told that in uh, chapter 2, verse 21. It said this, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. He has called you to suffer. It is better to... Um, It's better to suffer for doing good, but sometimes we suffer for doing wrong, and that's the consequences. You know, we deserve that, right, when it happens. But, you know, we, we have a Father, as believers, our Father is, um, we're told in Hebrews that He disciplines us, right? Because we're His children. And, and we discipline our children because we don't care about them, and they just deserve a few whacks. Is that why we... <laughs> No, it's not why. What what do we do with our kids? We discipline them because we we love them, we care about them, we want them to do well. And God loves us and he cares us and this this discipline that we receive in that situation is measured and it's loving and it's merciful. It's not just you know, you screwed up, now you're going to get it. We tend to think of them that way many times. We can thank Him that He doesn't give us everything we deserve on earth. Can you um, say amen to that? Spiritually, we deserve hell, but He's delivered us from this death by the death of His own Son. Verse 18. Sorry about that, Pastor. I'm infringing on your territory here. But I had to use this verse because it's so good. Christ suffered on, for our sins. He died a human sacrifice for our sins. At the heart of the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ, who is perfectly righteous, died for completely sinful people like us. He was victorious through his undeserved suffering. Verse 18, first part, for Christ died for sins once for all. This points out to Peter's readers. He's referring back to the previous four verses with this. He reminds them that they ought not to be surprised or discouraged by suffering since Christ triumphed in His sufferings even though He died an incredibly painful death of crucifixion, extreme torture, reserved for the worst of criminals. Jesus died that death. And if that wasn't bad enough, then He died... I mean, he's there in this terrible torture, but, but then sin comes into the picture. It's placed on him as a sacrifice. He died for our sins. That's for your sins and your sins and your sins and your sins. He died for our sins, each one of them. You can think of particular things. He died for that. The greatest example of suffering for good is Jesus' example of His death on the cross for us. Verse 18, Christ committed no sin. He was perfectly sinless. He fulfilled the law in every part of His life. In the Old Testament, it's pictured by animal sacrifice. Need to cover sin, have an innocent substitute, and Christ was that perfect sacrifice who fulfilled the Old Testament sacrificial system. He washes away sin completely, which that system was never able to do. The phrase hapax means it's perpetually valid, which means simply once for all. He did it once and it was done. And how is that significant? Well, for the Jews, 
they sinned and they slaughtered millions, millions of animals over the centuries. During the annual Passover, as many as a quarter of a million sheep would be sacrificed. But Jesus Christ's one sacrificial death ended the parade of animals to the altar. It was sufficient for all time for us. And the animals were good about that too, by the way. The perfection in Christ's death is expressed in the phrase that He might bring believers to God. There was a, as he died, there was a tearing of the, the curtain in the temple. If you look back and study a little bit about the temple to see how thick that curtain was, it was really, really thick. And it wasn't torn from the bottom by, or cut by men. It was torn from the top to the bottom. That was by God. And it was to give us access to God to allow us to come into His presence. He opened a way. Verse 18 says to bring us safely home to God. The throne of grace is open to us and it's made available and we can come boldly before Him. Even as royal priests. Chapter 2, verse 9. All believers are welcomed into God's presence. And there's a verb translated here, it's prosego, expresses this idea that Jesus is the one who introduces us to the ruler, to the king. Jesus now performs that function. Hebrews 6.20 says, concerning the inner court of heaven, that he has entered first for believers, having become a high priest forever. Turn to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. He, he is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, that's the human high priests of the Old Testament, he did not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this on their own. Uh, or I'm sorry, they did this for their own sins first, and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all, and he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness, but after the law was given, God appointed His Son with an oath, and His Son has been made the perfect high priest forever. That's how He brings us safely home. His own suffering. After He had lived a perfect life, become a sacrifice. It was accomplished once for all, for all of us, all who come to Him, repent and believe and trust Him. After this, we're told He sat down at the right hand of God. There was no more work to be done. He had accomplished our salvation and it will be carried out with our deliverance back to God when we die or when we're taken up into His presence. Last part of verse 18, he suffered physical death. He was human, but he was so much more than human. No human would make this statement, John 10, 18. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and take it up again. But that's what my father commanded. He's the only man who ever lived that controlled the moment of his own death. And then... He could be resurrected. And the Trinity participated in that. It speaks of His divine nature. In verse 18, the last part, it says that He was raised to life by the Spirit. There's the, the participation of the Trinity in this process. The Father, 
raised him, the Son raised himself, and the Spirit raised him and dwelt him and gave him power on earth. This is the one who holds our lives in his hands. He determines our days. He determines what we go through. None of it's a surprise when we suffer. Oh, let it be, let us suffer for doing good, not for, not for bad stuff. We remain true to him. Will he uh, suffer for doing the evil consequences of our own actions? Will we do that? I hope not. Yet it's even when we do, he's merciful, isn't he? As a loving father, he tempers it. He's merciful and gives us exactly what we need. Let us live courageously, not in fear as we serve the Master, who is the supreme ruler of the universe. He's the only one, the only redeemer, rescuer of people. Let us be ready to give an answer for a reason of the hope that's in you. Are you ready? Okay, I'm going to try that again. Are you ready? Thank you. Now, we're going to sing... And we, we sang earlier about you are our hope. It's in Him. It's in Christ alone. <laughs>